We are a week away from Christmas. And recently someone had asked me, what is Sanatana Dharma's view on Christmas? What is the purpose of Christmas? The way to understand Christmas, whenever you meet someone who is great, whenever you experience that which is great, you naturally feel like giving. It's as simple as when we offer a Purna Kumbha to a sadhu, someone who lives the life of the scriptures, that Purna Kumbha is indicating that you are full and I want to feel the same way. On Christmas, an incarnation of the divine manifests. And all of the people whether they're kings or peasants, whether they're animals or nature, they're all in tune with the greatness of that manifestation. And in that greatness, they all feel like giving. So Christmas is an opportunity of forgiveness. It is a time to feel that greatness, to ask for forgiveness and to offer forgiveness. That's internally. Externally, you give gifts. It's for giving. But that for giving should be only an expression of that forgiveness, forgiving others, forgiving yourself. And that happens when you feel that fullness, when you feel that greatness. You will observe this idea of asking for forgiveness, offering forgiveness throughout our Vedanta and Ramayana course. And what this course is teaching us <coughs> is that our whole life should be an utsava. What does utsava mean? Festival literally, but it means to lift oneself up. Utsava, like udasina, to sit above. The idea is to let go of smallness in our actions, in our words, in our thinking. And these opportunities through Christmas, Makara Sankranti, and on and on and on, those are reminders to us. For giving and for giving. Every day, every moment should be an utsava for us. We should wake up and say, good morning God, instead of Good God morning. <laughs> you just change the words around and your whole experience changes. Do you live your life like every day is an utsava? And you're thinking that's not possible because you're only thinking of it in a party sense. Think about how you feel when you go to a sattvic party where people are going to be engaged in good conversation. It's going to be healthy. You look forward. You can't wait to be there. Every day, every experience should be like that. And it can be like that. Because it's not about painting the living room, it's about painting the vase. Yatha drishti, tatha srishti. As your vision, so is creation. Last week, in our Vedanta and Ramayana course, we studied that we need to get married. 
I'm looking at all of the younger people in the room right now. We need to get married. And what I really mean by that is Mother Parvati and Bhagavan Shiva got married last week for us. Mother Parvati symbolizes faith. Bhagavan Shiva symbolizes trust. Shraddha and Vishwas. We chant that in our opening prayers. Their marriage should happen in our personalities, where we have to go from faith to trust. See, we're, we're just flirting with belief right now. But this course is teaching us, leave alone belief, you have to get to trust. And only when faith marries trust, in other words, when we grow up, then trust can get married to peace. See, we are Mother Parvati. Unless we get married to Lord Shiva, we cannot then have darshan or the presence of Bhagavan Rama, who symbolizes that ananda. In Ramayana right now, we've not even studied Ra Bhagavan Rama. We've only studied Bhagavan Shiva. This marriage needs to take place in our hearts. When Mother Parvati marries Bhagavan Shiva, she's an awesome wife, he's an awesome husband, they're an awesome couple. One of the raws that I had asked all of the study groups was to write down the seven most cheerful couples that you know. The seven most cheerful couples you know, actually know. And I said, don't write the Obamas or the Clintons or whoever else. You don't know them. I mean, you know well. And the implication of that raw, that reflection adventure of the week is, if your name is not on there, you need to study Ramayana. If your name is on there, don't tell people that, but good that your name is on there. I'm the happiest couple I, <laughs> that I know. <laughs> Mother Parvati asks Bhagavan Shiva three questions. She asks him, is Bhagavan Brahma? Question number one. Question number two, she says, why does Nirguna, that presence which has no name and form, why does that presence take on Saguna, take on a name and form? That's question number two. Question number three is, what is the purpose for Bhagavan's avatar? Three questions she asks. What was question number one? I said this 15 seconds ago. <laughs> Is Bhagavan Brahman? Number two? Why from Nirguna to Saguna? And number three? I said this five seconds ago. <laughs> what is the purpose of Bhagavan's avatar? Okay. Here are the answers that Bhagavan Shiva gives. Answer number one. Bhagavan is Brahman. In fact, he even tells Mother Parvati, he says, I didn't like that you asked that question. He said, you think that there's a difference between Bhagavan and Brahman. I didn't like it, indicating that they're not different. The answer to number two is, <coughs> Bhagavan goes from Nirguna to Saguna because of Bhakti. Because of people like us who have a love for knowing Bhagavan, Bhagavan becomes known. Isn't it? When you play hide-and-go-seek and you really just can't find anyone, you say, I give up, just come out. And out of love, that child comes out and says, here I am, right? But it only happens with surrender. Otherwise, the game goes on and on and on. That kid falls asleep. You keep looking around. <laughs> and number three, why does Bhagavan take avatar? There are so, so, so many reasons, infinite reasons, but in Ramayana, six are mentioned. There are six specific reasons why Bhagavan takes avatar. As we end our course for this semester, I will share some of those reasons with you. So, we begin with one of those reasons. I'm on the 122nd section of Chopais. I am taking the first line of the 
First, I'm sorry, did I say Chopais? Yes, I'm taking the Doha. The Doha in the 122nd section of Chopais, which is on page 92. Here's what Goswamiji says. Bahi nisachara jaite mahavira balavan kumbakarana ravana sumbuta sura viraje jagajan. Which means these two brothers were born as powerful demons. Their names were Ravana and Kumbhakarna. And they were ones who were able to defeat even the devas. In fact, it's shared that these two were known as the tamers of Indra's pride. Now, what two brothers is Goswamiji referring to? Jaya and Vijaya. So I'll tell you about this. Bhagavan Vishnu lives with Mother Lakshmi in Vaikuntha. And just like we have gated communities, just like we have alarms, Bhagavan also has security guards. And these security guards of Bhagavan, their names are Jaya and Vijaya. And they only have one boss, and that is Bhagavan Narayana. No one else is their boss. So one day, Mother Lakshmi was coming back to Vaikuntha. And Jaya and Vijaya stopped Mother Lakshmi. Now any wise person knows if the husband's the boss, the wife is also the boss. Correct? But Jaya and Vijaya, see they were interpreting their role too literally. And whenever you take matters too literally, it's not the full picture, correct? They stopped Mother Lakshmi. But she's the goddess of the universe. She was easily able to dismiss them and go to Bhagavan Vishnu. So she told them, she said, you know, your security guards, they don't think enough. And he registered that. But if he chided them for that, it would have become personal, right? His wife is complaining about these two. And if he starts, you know, yeah, yeah, your wife made you say that. And he couldn't allow that. So he gave Jaya and Vijaya another chance. And so who came next? The Sanat Kumaras. The Sanat Kumaras are the sons of Bhagavan Brahma. So Bhagavan Brahma, he's the creator. He has access everywhere. So do his children. They're equally as great. And once again, Jaya and Vijaya said, you cannot come and see Bhagavan Narayana. You are not qualified to see them. These are the Sanat Kumaras. These are enlightened beings. And they're young boys. They look like our Vanara kids. Not like Vanaras, like Vanara <laughs> students, our youngest class students here. And Jaya and Vijaya were standing big and, and proud. And when the Sanat Kumaras, they experienced this, they told Jaya and Vijaya, you know what you're doing? You're acting like Rakshasas. And since you're acting like Rakshasas, as you think, so you become. May you be Come Rakshasas. And Jaya and Vijaya were cursed to become Rakshasas. Not once, not twice, but three times they were cursed to be Rakshasas. To ensure that their thinking process is changed. Now, Jaya and Vijaya first became Hiranyaksha and Hiranya Kashyapu. Hiranyaksha, Hiranya means gold. Aksha means the one who's always looking for gold. So many Indians are Hiran Hiranyaksha. <laughs> but it's not just gold, it is people who live a life for possessions. They are Hiranyaksha. And what's fascinating is Hiranyaksha was Jaya and Vijaya, which shows us what our potential is. Hiranya Kashyapu. Kashyapu means the one who sleeps on gold. People who only live life of a life of pleasure, of comfort, of luxury, they are Hiranya Kashyapu. These two brothers then in the next reincarnation became Ravana and 
Kumbhakarna. Ravana is the one who cried and made the whole world cry. Kumbhakarna is the one who doesn't listen to anyone. Karna means ears. Kumbha means pot. But the problem with Kumbhakarna is that the pot was turned inside. So nothing could go in, into that pot. And then in their third incarnation, they became Shishupal and Dantavakra. So you see Lord Rama's time, you see Lord Krishna's time, Shishupal and Dantavakra. And Shishupal was that person who insulted Bhagavan Krishna a hundred times. And Dantavakra was equally as vicious. So this is what the Katha shares. But what does this mean for you and I? So here's the adhyatmic meaning, the Vedanta part of Ramayana. To be able to serve Bhagavan, one has to be evolved. You know what Acharya Vijayji said on Friday? He said that no one deserves to study Vedanta. And he just left it at that, asking us to think about that statement. What he's sharing is, so many of us live a life of, I'm a good person, so I deserve goodness. Vedanta is teaching you that your nature is infinite. It is called paravidya. Good actions don't bring you to Vedanta. It is only grace that can expose you to Vedanta. Jaya and Vijaya get to be in the presence of Bhagavan perpetually, but what happened is they became proud. For you and I to be vigilant, to be grateful for these opportunities, not to be proud of these opportunities. And I've emphasized endless times, before you start being a sevaka, you have to be a sadaka. You have to learn how to serve before you serve, because if you just serve without learning how to serve, it's just a different form of ego. It's destructive. You saw Jay and Vijaya. They were destroyed and they caused destruction. But Bhagavan is so forgiving. Remember how I started the discourse? He forgave them. He actually didn't take three incarnations. He took four. Just in case they had to be incarnated again, he was already ready to come. For the Sanat Kumaras, Jay and Vijaya are the servants of Bhagavan Narayana. They actually have no right to punish Jay and Vijaya. Imagine I come to your home and suppose your kids are misbehaving. Suppose. I know it doesn't happen, but suppose. <laughs> and I say, you know, what kind of parents are you? I have no right to say that to you because you're the parents. They're your kids. You're perpetually with them. I'm an outsider. I'm a visitor in that sense, correct? It's not appropriate. So why didn't Bhagavan Narayana tell the Sanat Kumaras, who are you to punish my servants? To uphold their virtue. He forgave them. Their curse is going to manifest, but he went down to save them. It shows again, Bhagavan Vishnu didn't just forgive Jaya and Vijaya, he also forgave the Sanat Kumaras. That's amazing that he said, I will take on a name and form just to uphold your word. Remember Bhishma said, I will make you pick up a weapon to Bhagavan Krishna. Do you think Bhagavan Krishna <laughs> needed to pick up a weapon? But he did it to keep Bhishma's words strong. And, you know, the Sanat Kumaras, they learned their lesson. They became Prahlad and Vibhishana. So they weren't ignorant people that, oh, I made a mistake and who cares? They also realized that they made a mistake. They asked for forgiveness by coming with Bhagavan. Again, as Prahlad and Vibhishana. You see, I just read one line, but how much depth of forgiveness is narrated here? We all make mistakes. Ask for forgiveness. Forgive yourself. You know, the Rajasic seeker, the person who's filled with aggression, when they make a mistake, they decided to get up at 6 a.m., but they didn't, so they got up at 6.15 a.m.
but they thought at 6.15, I've already gotten up late, I may as well make it 7.15 a.m. And on and on and on. That's rajas. But the sattvic seeker, the one who's filled with calmness, they made a mistake by getting up at 6.15. Really, the mistake is getting up anytime past 3 a.m. <laughs> it's a mistake. <laughs> but the sattvic seeker says, I tried. And I didn't get up, but now I'll get up. And I love how Swami Tejramayananda shared this. He says, based on um, chapter 6 of Srimad Bhagavad Gita, every seeker has to promise themselves, number one, that they will not fall further. You watch one episode of Netflix you shouldn't be watching. Some show, don't watch the second. <laughs> you will not fall further. And then his second point was, and you will lift yourself from there. So now in here we have 75 people, 70 different five levels of evolution. Someone's at rung 100, someone's at rung 10, someone's on rung negative three. Wherever you are, you lift yourself from there. Okay? And now we get to a very hilarious and awesome and powerful section of Ramayana called Narada Moha Prasanga. And it's an awesome way to finish our studies for the year. But before I tell you about that, I want to read a line that um, Bhagavan Shiva responds to Mother Parvati with. He says, Bole bihasi mahesa tava jnani mudana koi jehi jasa ragupati karahi jabaso tasa tehi chana hoi. Mother Parvati had asked Bhagavan Shiva, why does Bhagavan take avatara? And Bhagavan Shiva says, he laughs after narrating the reason why he took avatara, jaya, vijaya, etc. He laughs and said, Nobody is a jnani, nobody is a mudha. Bhagavan Shiva Singh, nobody is a jnani. Sanat Kumaras, not jnanis. Nobody is mudha, jay and vijay. He says, man instantly becomes what the Lord of the Ragus wills that person to become in that moment. In other words, you and I are exactly the way we're supposed to be. Acceptance is a powerful virtue that we need to practice with others and with ourselves. You and I will be enlightened when Bhagavan wishes. And later on I'll tell you, Lord Shiva says again, he says all of this is Hari Icha. In uh, Islam, what is their equivalent to Hari Icha? What did they say? Inshallah, correct? As Allah wishes. We say, Hari Icha. And because of Sanskrit, it becomes Hari Icha. But the point is, all of this that is going on, all that will go on, is all Hari Icha. And the implication of this is, don't worry. <laughs> Revel! Revel in joy. Live life like it's an utsava. Lord Shiva says this so many times to Mother Parvati. So now we enter Naradji onto the scene. I am on the 127th section of Chopais. I'm taking the second Chopai, the first line. So 127, 2, 1. On page 95. Bayau na Narada mana kachu rosha. That Narad Muni, there was no rage in his mind. Kahi priya bachana kama paritosha. He spoke to Kama Deva in very loving words. Now, how did this come about? I'll explain. Naradji has a curse on him from Daksha. Daksha cursed Narad Muni that you cannot stay in one place for a long period of time. 
That's why when you see cereals, Naraji's always roaming around. Sometimes he's in space, sometimes he's underwater. He's just wandering. I don't know how long, but I'll tell you, Bhagwan Vedvyasa's son, Shuka, he has proclaimed that he's so independent, he's such a Vairagi, that he doesn't stay in one place longer than it takes to milk a cow. How long does it take to milk a cow? <laughs> You get the milk carton from the fridge, you pour it into a glass. We don't know, but it can't be that long to milk a cow. And then he moves. So Narad Muni has a curse. See, Shukadev, he chooses to be like that. Narad Muni has been cursed to do that. But one day he was in the Himalayas. And Narad Muni, he never complains about the cold. Unlike all of us, <laughs> he just has his dhoti and he barely wears a kurta. We have our North Face jackets and our Canada Goose gloves and all of that. And we still complain. And he's in the Himalayas. And he happens to see this beautiful cave. See, when we see a cave, we think of monsters and run. <laughs> when a seeker sees a cave, he's like, oh, I can spend some time in silence over there. Your cave is now in Mars, Pennsylvania. And he goes into that cave and he starts thinking about Hari, Bhagavan Narayana. And as he's thinking about Bhagavan Narayana, who's watching him? Indra. Indra is the chief minister of all of the Devatas. For all of the people from Bharat, what are chief ministers always doing? Try to speak clean as you, <laughs> as you share this. They're always afraid of losing their power, correct? They always create schemes to stay in power. Indra is always doing that too. See, I told you everything comes from Ramayana. Yet everything can be sourced here. Indra thinks that Narada is remembering Hari because he wants to be the king of the Devatas. Does Narada Muni want that? He's not interested in singing and dancing. He wants Hari. He wants peace. But Indra, because he's greedy, He's always suspicious. So he calls Kamadeva. In English, what do we call Kamadeva? Cupid. See, Cupid came from Kamadeva. He calls Kamadeva and says, go distract Narad Muni. And we always make Kamadeva very stupid, but he's actually not stupid at all. When they told Kamadeva to go disturb, disturb Bhagavan Shiva, what did Kamadeva tell Lord Brahma? You're asking me to commit suicide. He says that. You're asking me to commit suicide, but for ser serving humanity, I'll do it. Here too, he tells Indra, what you're asking me will be my destruction. But to uphold your instruction as the king of the Devatas, I will do that. Didn't Lord Rama do that with Raja Dashrata too? Raja Dashrata asked him to leave, and he left to uphold the king's adesha. So, Kamadeva goes and he shoots Indra. He shoots Indra. Indra's already shot. He shoots Naradji with this arrow of lust. And when it hits Naradji, it's like, like a feather falling on him. It just woke him up. That's it. And Kamadeva, his experience was this, was the last time he did this, he got <laughs> burned down. So there's a lot of trepidation that he, he's just waiting. Okay, what's going to happen now? Narad Muni comes over to him and says, hey, what are you doing? And he says, this is what I'm doing. And he says, oh, no worries. I'm not mad at you. There's no rage in his mind. He says, Priya Vachana to um, Kamadeva. Kamadeva, stunned. Indra, stunned. Naraji leaves that place. In his wanderings, he ends up in Kailash. And who lives in Kailash? Bhagavan Shiva and Mother Parvati. And when he sees Bhagavan Shiva, he starts telling Bhagavan Shiva, you know, you and I, we've gone through similar ex experiences. You got distracted by Kamadeva. I got distracted by Kamadeva. 
But you know what's different between me and you, Bhagavan Shiva? You got mad and I, I didn't. He's telling Bhagavan Shiva this. You lost your cool, not me. Now, if you've ever been in that situation where someone says, why are you getting angry? And you say, I'm not getting angry. <laughs> it makes you more infuriated. So he's telling Bhagavan Shiva that you got angry and I didn't get angry. And Bhagavan Shiva right away tells Narad Muni, what you've experienced is great. And he folds his hands to Narad Muni. This is Bhagavan Shiva, Jagadishwara. He says, please don't tell this to Hari. Please don't tell this to Bhagavan Narayana. That's his only request. What does Narad Muni do? Right away, he's on his way to meet Bhagavan Hari. <laughs> Just like we do, okay? Don't eat that cake. You know, you're told not to eat that cake at home that you're saving for, for someone else. <laughs> All you can think about is that cake. Narad Muni, he right away goes to meet Hari. And it's shared, Bhagavan Shiva says that that advice he gave didn't sit well with Narad Ji. Aren't we Narad Ji in this moment? Does anyone here like advice? <laughs> right, you're all thinking. As I'm giving you advice, you're looking away. <laughs> Is there anyone here who's not an expert at giving advice? If you're not an expert at giving advice, if you're an expert at giving advice, keep your hand down. See? <laughs> and Narad Muni, see, he's so used to giving advice that he's not used to getting advice. Sattvic ego, isn't it? I'm so used to serving, I don't want to be served. But asking for help also requires one to bend down. To help, needs to, you need to bend down. To ask for help, you need to bend down. So he goes to Bhagavan Narayana. And usually when he goes to Bhagavan Narayana, it's to praise Bhagavan Narayana, right? You are the Lord, I love you. He goes to Bhagavan Narayana, not to praise Bhagavan Narayana, but for his own self-promotion. He says to Bhagavan Narayana, you know your BFF, Bhagavan Shiva, he got mad. I didn't. <laughs> He's telling this to Bhagavan Narayana. What Goswamiji says about Bhagavan Narayana? He says, Bhagavan Narayana is Vedanta personified. When we think of Vedanta, we think of Sunday Satsang, Gita, etc., Goswamiji says, Bhagavan Vishnu is Vedanta. He says, the Veda is the breath of Bhagavan Vishnu. So naturally, Vedanta, which is the essence of the Veda, is Bhagavan Vishnu. And when Narad Muni starts telling Bhagavan Vishnu about this, Bhagavan Vishnu, in his mind, says, can I do what's best for you, Narad Muni? And Narad Muni says, see, he's waiting for recognition. He's waiting for a reward. Bhagavan Vishnu says, can I do what's best for you? And Narad Muni, his projection is, you're going to give me this applause or this gift. So right away he says, yes, you can do what's best for me. <laughs> and Bhagavan Vishnu in his mind said, this ego went from a seed to a full-blown tree in Narad's personality, and I have to come in there like a forest fire and burn it down. It's amazing how descriptive this Ramayana is. So, Bhagavan Narayana begins to work on Naradji's sattvic ego. And I use the word sattvic because he's not like Ravana. Narad Muni is put here because he's like you and I. Lord Rama's not born yet. He's exactly in the place like you and I. So what happens? When Bhagavan Vishnu gets permission from Narad Muni, he calls his worker, Maya. Bhagavan Vishnu is Maya Pati. He's the Lord of Maya. He calls her over and says, I want you to create a city that's even more grand than Vaikuntha. And Maya does that, 
even before snapping one's fingers, created. And I said Naid Muni is a wanderer, right? He happened to be wandering into that city. And in that city, there was great celebration. Everything was decorated. It smelled like pakoras and smelled like kachori. Everything you shouldn't eat regularly, it smelled like that. <laughs> Everyone looked so good. And as Naad Muni is wandering around, he finds out that there is a wedding that's about to take place there. And the bride is ready, but there's no bridegroom that's ready for this. And Naad Muni, he said, oh, Utsava, right? I'm a wanderer. I need to eat. I like to see things. So he goes over there. And who is the bride? Vishwa Mohini. Now think of these words. What does Vishwa mean? Multiverse. Mohini, the one who creates Moha. That's her name, Vishwa Mohini. Nad Muni didn't think about that. Now did he? Would you ever marry someone whose name is Vishwa Mohini? <laughs> Be scared if that's her name or his name. But Nad Muni wasn't. He wasn't thinking. And immediately, she really, she was, it's shared, more beautiful than Mother Lakshmi. And I like that that was shared. I'll use very slang, urban dictionary words, terminology here. You want to marry someone who's beautiful, not someone who's hot. The, latter, the former, latter will go away very quickly, but beauty will stay. Beauty will deepen, hotness will get cool. So that's why it's shared that she's more beautiful than Mother Lakshmi. Right away, we should know that's not possible. So Vishwa Mohini is there. And the king, that's Vishwa Mohini's father, he goes to Nard Muni and says, what kind of groom will my daughter marry? So Nard Muni starts to describe himself. <laughs> Actually, the actual description that he reads his descriptions of Bhagavan Vishnu, but what does he say? He starts describing himself. And then the father is very happy, and Narad Muni leaves that scene, and right away, Narad Muni, who's always chanting, Narayana, Narayana, he had no time for Japa, no mind for Japa. He is thinking about Bhagavan Narayana because he wants Bhagavan Narayana's charm and beauty. Before he wanted his darshan, correct? He wanted to chant his name, but now he also wants Narayana, but he wants his charm and beauty. So he goes back to Bhagavan Narayana and he prays to Bhagavan Narayana, Bhagavan, you know I'm your most sincere devotee. You know that I'm always thinking about you. I'm always wanting you. So Bhagavan, please bless me to look like you. Please bless me that I may look exactly like you do. And Bhagavan Vishnu is handsome. We had studied earlier that Bhagavan Vishnu was the best man in Lord Shiva's Bharat. So when Lord Shiva's Bharat arrived at uh, Mother Parvati's home, all of the people in the family were so happy that if the best man looks like this, imagine how the groom is going to look. But who came after Bhagavan Vishnu? <laughs> All of the Ganas. Some had one eye, some had no head, some were, were, were floating. <laughs> it's all described in here. So Bhagavan Vishnu says, Tata Astu. Tata Astu, so be it. May you look like me, Hari. And Bhagavan, sorry, Narad Muni is extremely happy that he is going to look exactly like Bhagavan Vishnu. And there's a a portion that's shared here that if a patient goes to a physician and says, I want this medicine, but the physician knows that that medicine is not good for them, it's the physician's responsibility to give them the medicine that is good for them, correct? All of the physicians, you have a, a legal right to do that, leave alone a philosophical one. So Bhagavan Vishnu made Narad Muni look like Hari. And what does Hari mean? A monkey. Another word for Hari is monkey. Narad Muni looked hideous. See, Hanumanji looks handsome, but this monkey looked hideous. Imagine all monkeys combined into one. So like big cheeks, but small eyes. And you know, 
Harry in the wrong places, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So hideous. But nobody could see Nad Muni's hideousness. Nobody, okay? He looked hideous, but they all just saw Nad Muni. But watching all of this were Bhagavan Shiva's gunas, his spies. When Bhagavan Shiva told Narumuni not to go tell Bhagavan Vishnu, he sent spies to make sure. And those spies observed that. <laughs> he right away did this. So those spies were following him. Now Narumuni goes back to that area where the Swayamvara is happening. Vishwamohini shows up with her flower garland. And she's looking at all of the princes who have gathered. Narumuni is there too. He thinks he looks like Bhagavan Vishnu. It's a done deal, right? Everyone wants to marry Bhagavan Vishnu. In fact, Mother Lakshmi married Bhagavan Vishnu while he was sleeping. <laughs> In the churning of the milky ocean when Bhagavan Vishnu was tired, Bhagavati Lakshmi came and put that garland around him. Legally, they didn't get married because he was sleeping. <laughs> so this princess is walking around with this flower garland. And she is going person to person to person. Narad Muni keeps getting out of his seat, you know, kind of like he's yawning and just kind of flexing his muscles to draw attention to himself. He's fidgeting. You know, like you're in a conversation, you just keep coughing. <clears throat> <clears throat> like, I'm here right now. Pay, <laughs> pay attention to me. He's doing that. He's fidgeting. She sees him. And she sees Hari. She sees the hideousness of him, and she's so angry that he had the audacity to come to this Swayamvara. So she shuns him, looks at her like friends, and keeps moving. And he's just so surprised that he looks like Hari and she didn't want to marry him. And then he starts hearing these sarcastic comments that are being made. Hey, Hari, how come you didn't get married? Hey, Hari, what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be in the jungle? Hey, Hari, don't you need to shave right now? <laughs> Shiva's ganas are teasing Narad Muni. And they were teasing him the whole time, but he didn't hear them because he was distracted by Vishwamohini. Now, Vishwamohini finally gets married to the most handsome being there. Bhagavan Narayana showed up there too. And assumed the form of a prince, and Vishwamohini marries him. And Naraji is so dejected, and his dejection is now being directed at these ganas who are telling him, go look in the mirror. And he's so irate at them, and when he realizes, he does look in the mirror, he realizes that he does look like Hari, he just loses himself completely. First, he curses those ganas. He says to those ganas that you are making fun of me because I look like a monkey? May you look like a monkey. And then he goes straight to Bhagavan Narayana. Narad Muni, his greatest devotee, goes to him and says, you are such a thief. You are so jealous. In that churning of the milky ocean, poison came out and you gave it to your best friend? What kind of friend are you? That um, Amrit came out and you stole it and took it for yourself? You are a thief. You are jealous of me. You disguised yourself and got married and you made me look like this? The way that I've looked like a monkey, monkeys are going to help you in your next incarnation. And not only that, the way that you separated me from my potential wife, your wife is going to be separated from you. Curses Bhagavan Narayana. People who are going to help you are going to be monkeys. Your wife is going to get separated from you. Partially, partially, temporarily. And in that moment, Bhagavan Vishnu lifted that maya. Vishwamohini disappeared. Naraji looked exactly like he is. And in that moment, he came back to his clarity. And he felt so 
sad at what he had done. And he begged Bhagavan for forgiveness that I, I didn't know what happened. And Bhagavan Vishnu smiles and says, Hari Icha. <laughs> it's my will that this happened, Naraji. No worries. And he comes down as Rama. And his helpers are monkeys. And Mother Sita gets parted from all of that. I will finish by sharing a chopai that Bhagavan Vishnu tells Naraji, you feel sad. And here's what I want you to do to overcome your sadness. I'm on the 138th section of Chopais. The third Chopai, the first line on page 101, this is what Bhagavan Vishnu tells Naraji, who is feeling genuinely asking for forgiveness. What can I do? He says, Japahu Jai Sankara Sata Nama Hoihi Hridaya Turata Vishrama. Naraji, go chant Shankara's name. Shata. Shata means a hundred times. And Turata means Turanti. Quickly, your heart will fi find Vishra, will find rest. So here, Bhagavan Vishnu is telling Naraji, I've already forgiven you. And if you want to forgive yourself, then what you need to do is chant Shankara's name. He doesn't say his own name. Shankara's name a hundred times. And you will find peace. And this is such a loving message, which is why I wanted to finish with this message for all of us. Don't we chant that if you chant Hanuman Chalisa a hundred times, that person will be Sukahoi, correct? That person will be happy. Is there anyone in this room who's chanted Hanuman Chalisa more than a hundred times? So many of you have a hundred times or more. Have you found peace? When Goswamiji says here a hundred times, Hanuman Chalisa a hundred times, he's saying with that humility, of someone who is asking for forgiveness. You may have nothing to ask for forgiveness for. Really, we have lots to ask for forgiveness for. But even if you feel like you have nothing to ask for, but with that level of humility, which creates sincerity, that we just need to chant a hundred times. And all of the peace that you and I are trying through pleasure and possession and position, that peace will be with us turanti, immediately. Many of you may be thinking this is too easy. You know what? I was with Guruji and someone said, Swami Tejumayananda, can you give me a sadhana? So he gave him this sadhana. And that person said, it's too hard. So then Guruji said, do japa. And that person said, it's too easy. <laughs> See that ego. This is too hard, that's too e easy. Sattvic ego is I don't want to do anything. I'm already like this. We may be thinking this is too easy. That's because faith and trust haven't been married in your heart yet. When faith and trust get married in your heart, you will sincerely chant 100 times and you will be free. Oh.